Welcome to the latest edition of Circling the Bases. I'm DJ Short, and with me here once again is Scott Pianowski from Yahoo. Thanks to those of you joining us on Twitch this afternoon, and for those of you listening in podcast form or watching later on YouTube or recording on Monday afternoon. How was your weekend, Scott? We, we did a little bit of talk pre-air. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, we were talking some NBA playoffs. We were talking a little NHL playoffs, a little bit of PGA. It's just a fun time in the sports calendar. Obviously, baseball is in full swing. We'll, we're going to talk baseball today and some other fun stuff. But I'm a fan of all sports. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, we, we, there was a second uh, race in the Kentucky Dirt in the um, in the Triple Crown for Preakness. horse racing, the Preakness, which was a great race. Um, there's all sorts of fun stuff happening in soccer. I'm, I'm into all of it, man. Um, you know, auto racing, there's a lot of stuff going on. So, even though this is a baseball podcast, we are fans of all sports. And uh, to me, I was between playing some golf myself, I, I had the TV on pretty much all weekend. It was a great time. So, will the NBA be happy with Nuggets Heat Finals? <laughs> Oh, they, yeah, I, I, I joked on Twitter that you know the, the Celtics Lakers third place championship series is going to be lit, right? Because that's yeah. obviously what they wanted. They're both down 0 3. I, I believe no team has ever come back from a 3 0 deficit. We've seen it in other yeah. sports, obviously. Yeah. The, 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 Red Rams, Sox. the Red Sox did it, it's happened a few times in hockey, but it hasn't happened in the NBA. And what, why do you think that is, Scott? Well, for a long time, it's because home court was so dominant that it just it was yeah. hard to imagine teams winning on the road. Mm-hmm. I think eventually some team is going to come back from a 3-0 deficit, but I just can't see it. I think the, the Lakers are just overmatched, and the Celtics, man, Jimmy Butler. I remember Bob Knight, the Indiana coach, had a great quote about Scott Skiles, who was this controversial point guard for Michigan State, but was an unbelievable player. And Knight went to his team, and he said, you know, Scott Skiles could never play for Indiana because of some of the things he's done off the court, but he has more heart than every one of you combined. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I feel about this Heat-Celtics team. I mean, look. Jalen Brown's a great player. Jason Tatum's a great player, but they play entitled at times. They play a little bit too hero ballish at times. And and Jimmy Butler, he wasn't a lottery pick. He hardly played his rookie year in Chicago. He's mm-hmm. made himself into a dynamic player. And look what they did. They had to win the playoff game, just the playing game, That's just right. to get into the, the bracket of eight. Spolster's right. probably going to the Hall of Fame. He's getting all these coaches mm-hmm. fired. He got Milwaukee's coach fired. The Celtics will probably make a change. Mm-hmm. I just have so much respect. The Florida Panthers, who took my Bruins out a few weeks ago, so much respect for them. We talked about this before the show. These were teams, the Panthers were the best team in hockey last year. Miami, yeah. it was really close to the best record. They may have had the best record last year. Maybe it's just a year later where things kind of come together. But I have so much respect for the Panthers and the Heat, these teams that are really cohesive. Yeah. They're not necessarily about one guy. Butler's obviously the the guy in Miami, but, he, but they won game three at 14 points, right? I, to right. the death of your single game parlay, I heard. But I have so much, res- I have yes. so much respect for this Miami team. And it's fun. I grew up in an age where the home teams won too often in the NBA. And yeah. so I think it's yeah. fun to see – underdogs can win and the one versus eight isn't a fait accompli the way it used to be right and i think to me that's a certainly a feature not a bug yeah it is interesting in the in the uh era of sports betting how this all goes because you're used to i mean the lakers were favored heavily on on saturday and you know i, w- I was on their side for that one and uh it didn't work out that way but uh, you know, there's opportunity there for betting too, especially in the you know before where... the Celtics late Heat series started. I was in a text thread with my Boston friends, and we were all like, "Why are the Celtics minus five fifty? Yeah, they favored, sure, but my, yeah. this is a great price on Miami." We all agreed that the line was stupid, and yeah. then the series starts, and we're all looking at each other. Did they bet at Miami? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're all like kicking right. ourselves because we all thought it was a, a gross misprice. Not that. Yep. Again, I wasn't saying Miami was definitely going to win, but you could have gotten them at really good odds, and it, it just exactly. seemed like an, it just seemed like an overlay. And yeah, you don't yeah. have to win those that many bets when you get overlays like that. You only have to win some of them. The sprinkle, know. and you're good. You know, there you go. Um, so missed opportunity there. Uh, who who would you like in the final? Assuming it looks like a Denver Miami collision course, let's uh, try to get ahead of this. Who are we going to be on? I have to go with Denver. Yeah. Uh, you know the superstar power that they have. They have just been so persistent uh, in that series against the Lakers. Uh, yeah, I, I I have to go Denver. I think they'll be favored. You know, I think they'll be heavily favored actually. Yeah, but but the, hey, give credit to the Heat. You know, outlasting the Knicks. I'm sure some Knicks fans are saying, "Man, we could have done this too." You know what I mean? But I think if there's any solace, it's the team that beat you. You know, goes to the final. So there's something you, to that too. You mentioned the Knicks. I, I know you're obviously a diehard Mets fan. If we take baseball out of it, what? 
professional sports team matters the most to you? It would be the Commanders. Uh, really? I did not know team. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I grew up outside Washington, D.C. So when I came of age of watching sports, my, my dad was a Commanders fan, a Washington football fan. So I just took up that flag. I've never really had an NBA team. Uh, I I followed the Bulls in the '90s, and then Penny and Shaq, you know, uh, you know, in the late '90s. But since then, never really had a team. I guess I follow the Knicks, but I'm not like a diehard fan of them. But yeah, for the most part, it's Commanders for me. Were you old enough to appreciate the Ripon team that won the championship? Yes, that is what got me into them. The most uh, underrated great NFL team I think in modern history. That team was an yeah. absolute juggernaut, and that's they why I never get too down on Buffalo going to four straight Super Bowls and losing all four of them. Because one of the teams they ran into was Washington. Nobody oh, yeah. was going to beat them that year. They, they lost to Dallas a couple of times. You know, the Giants game was a coin flip game. It could have gone either way. Obviously, it came down to a field goal. Um, give Belichick credit for a great game plan, but you know, going to four Super Bowls is really, really hard. And I just don't mm-hmm. think anybody was beating the the Washington team in 1991. Yeah, since then it's been it's been very dark. I thought I was set up for success for the long term, but uh, you know, not. We'll, we'll see. Things, it's things a new are looking era. forward. Yeah, they got the yeah. new ownership coming in. They they finally got the nickname scrubbed out of there. Uh, mm-hmm. They they were actually a scrappy team the last couple of years. They I thought. I think Ron Rivera yeah, is the right so. guy for the the team right now. I don't know how long he'll be there, but I think Ron Rivera is a good coach for a team that's trying to kind of rebrand itself and figure itself out. So. It, it's at least things are trending upward and that's all we want in sports is we hope, want hope. hope i mean look i live in greater detroit right all we all we want is hope right mm-hmm. the nba draft lottery you know detroit's got the best odds to get the number one pick when there's a generational yeah. prospect coming out now they, <laughs> they get like you know they get, they get nowhere near the number one pick yeah but yeah. all you want yeah. is hope right I, it, the fact that the tigers are playing just under 500 baseball is not it's you, you want the team to not be terrible and who knows maybe the nl central or the al central i should say can be stolen by somebody right now toronto the last place team in the al east would be in first place in the al central True. so uh i gotta get shoehorn in some baseball talk here i know you came here for our nba hot takes and for our washington <laughs> commanders hot takes and, and we have a really fun draft lined up that has nothing to do with sports at the end of this yeah. show but uh yeah. dj what do you think talk a little baseball yeah why don't we do that i think that's why we're here i think that's Good. why we get paid so Give the people what they want <laughs> we have a lot planned for today's episode as we usually do on mondays we'll talk about weekend fab and waiver wire pickups but i also wanted to expand upon a conversation we had last week about players you can drop certainly easy to talk about the players you're adding everywhere and players you should add what about players you should drop so we'll get into that in a minute if you hang with us, we have a super fun draft at the end of the show. Before we get into all that, though, remember to download the Roto World app to receive breaking player news all season long. Stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players on your roster. Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It's available in your app store today. So we're going to talk uh, whether to cut or keep a list of players here. These are all you know, players who we had expectations for going into the season, not necessarily first, second round, third round picks, but players who were drafted in most leagues who have disappointed to this point. So Scott and I have each come up with a couple of names to throw at each other. And I will kick it off here. Scott, tell me, should you keep or cut Ty France? Wow, that's a great name that you called out because I actually was in a league this weekend where I needed to make a cut to pick somebody up. And I'm like, who am I going to cut? And not him, not him, not him. Like, not Ty France. I'm like, wait a minute. Ty, Ty France isn't doing anything right now. His, his last 30 games, his stats are awful. I ultimately mm-hmm. decided to keep him. I thought there's just too much back class with him. What he did the last two years, hitting for a plus average, hitting for enough power to make an impact in that category. His overall stats aren't that bad. Again, they, they trend pretty bad. For the last month, and I know the batted ball profile isn't great, but I was in a league where I really came close to hitting that drop button. I had the transaction queued up, add player, drop France, and I backed off it. He's a hold for me. So he's 83% rostered in Yahoo leagues right now. So again, player drafted everywhere. Uh, I believe he had 20 homers last year, 18 homers the year before. He makes a lot of contact, and that's the thing where you're like, things have got to begun to even out for him eventually. 13.6% strikeout rate so far this season, the lowest of his career. Not a lot of hard contact, like you were saying, the batted ball profile, not super exciting. But I feel like 
everyone on this Mariners offense is underachieved. We could talk about Julio Rodriguez too. Obviously you're not dropping Julio Rodriguez, but man, he's been not great whatsoever so far this season. So, you know, maybe as the weather warms up, we'll see, you know, but France with the, his ability to make contact, I think there's at least a batting average upside and he's going to hit more than two home runs. You know, uh, there's going to be power occasionally, not going to be a 30 homer kind of slugger, but could he hit 10 home runs the rest of the way? I think that's very realistic to think that he could. Yeah, I think that's probably where I would project him. So we're on the same page on that. I'll give you one. Look, it's it's really hard to know what's going to happen when touted pitching prospects come up. And I'm at a point now where I want almost any path to the Baltimore Orioles. They are one of the mm. great stories of the year. And for as unbeatable as Tampa Bay looked early in the season, I know they've had a lot of injuries lately, including some major injuries on the pitching side. Baltimore's right there in that loaded AL East. And, and Grayson Rodriguez has had a really odd year because yeah. if you just told me, okay, he came up and he's got 50 strikeouts and 42 innings. I'm like, oh, he's one of the pickups of the season, right? Well, his ERA is over six. His whip is 1.64. If this were just a, a veteran pitcher, you'd probably cut him and not even think too much about it. But right. I see him in some of my leagues, I see him getting cut. In some of my leagues, I see him getting picked up. I, so the, the market right. is going both ways on Rodriguez right now. He's 55% rostered right. in Yahoo. Throw it over to you. What say DJ Short about Grayson Rodriguez? I would probably keep him, but be very selective about where I would use him uh, matchup wise. I think there's a lot of pitchers who fall into that classification right now where you're not super confident on every, any given night that they're going to perform at a high level for you. So I would look out for the matchups. Obviously, he's not going to have to pitch against the AL East as often as previous seasons. That's good. Uh, while he struggled at home this year, I think his ERA is north of seven at home. That is a pitcher-friendly ballpark. I think that'll start to even out for him. The peripherals are there. His most recent start was pretty good. He's given up quite a bit of hard contact so far. So that's something I think is a little bit troubling, but not necessarily predictive. Um, he's still starting to figure some things out. I think he's a keep, but I would use him wisely moving forward. His next start is against Texas. Have we seen <clears throat> enough from this season to label the Rangers as an avoid offense? I think in a matchup like this, I would. I mean, they're the, they're the best offense in baseball on, on paper right now, uh, at least – as far as what they've done into this point. So I think I would bench them for that matchup. Man, didn't you wish you knew that before the season? Yeah, just get all the Rangers. Thankfully, <laughs> I have a lot of Marcus Simeon. And I, you know, I, yeah. I, end up, I feel like I tweet like, you know, if I tweet 15 times in a week, I feel like two or three of the tweets are about Marcus Simeon, who's just one of my <laughs> favorites. I, I just love that guy. His stats, mm -hmm. he did not hit his first month in Texas. If you look at the last calendar year, and it, it, look, I, I know it's, it's picking an arbitrary endpoint, but it makes sense, right? He went to a new team. New yeah. city, you know, new living arrangement, all that stuff. And it took a while to get his feet wet, get comfortable. Since then, he has been a monster. I think his his last 162 is something like a 275 average, 125 runs, 30 homers, 108 RBIs, 30 steals, something in that neighborhood. I'm, I'm really close to the stats, whatever they are. But, I mean, he's been a first-round talent since the beginning of May last year. Adolis Garcia is a monster. They just got Corey Seager back. He's I got mean Seager back. That's a, that's a, and Josh Young, I like too. He's kind of bit up and down, but uh, yeah, they've got some pieces there. Even Leody Tavares, I, I think is yeah. worth adding. And he's sitting at the bottom of the lineup. Uh, I feel like any, you know, we talked about Jonah Heim some, I know he didn't have a great yeah, week last right. week, but he's been a top five catcher. Any path right. to Texas sounds good to me right now. Yeah. So next up a uh, name for you, Scott, a name we talked about when we did our positional preview episodes in the spring that we, we each liked. Andrew Vaughn uh, with the White Sox. What do you think? Keeper cut with him. Man, I, I say I feel like I say this every week that I want to burn almost everything I wrote about the White Sox. I guess Lucas Giolito's working out, but with Vaughn, yeah, yeah, it's like the, the 234 average, the 322 OBP. That's actually about the OBP you would have projected. The average, just a tiny bit unlucky, but the slugging has not come around as I expected. He's only slugging 406, which is not justified playing first base. His OPS plus is right around league average. A lot of that is driven by the walks. I would give him the rest of the month or the rest of the month. I maybe the next two or three weeks to sort things out and then and then I would cut him. He would be if you had if you had to cut him, fine. I would not proactively cut Andrew Vaughn yet, still just 25. And I yeah. feel like he's just I feel like he's more of a disappointment than a guy who's absolutely killing you right now. At least he's actually been timely with his hits. He's somehow driven yeah. in 31 runs. Yeah, he's got some he's driven in some runs for sure. So there's yeah. that. 
man, I I just look at this lineup and I'm like, yeah, okay, they got Tim Anderson back. It sounds like Eli Jimenez is coming back soon. I guess I can't yeah. quit the White Sox. Should I quit the White Sox? Because I I'm not quitting them. Yeah, I did. Now the funny thing was the one guy I did quit on is I wrote a piece about ten days ago about cutting Lance Lynn. And he's had two great starts. Oh, he has been good. That yeah. advice says, well, actually, I hedged it, right? Because I did write the article about, you know, considering dropping Lance Lane. I had Lance Lane in two leagues, and I didn't do this intentionally, but in one league, I thought it was easier to cut him because I liked my alternatives. In another league, it was a little bit of a deeper league. I felt like I had to hold on to him. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, if, no matter where the story goes, at least one of these teams will be satisfied. And uh, <laughs> so one of my teams is happy. It's wishy washiness. It's a great trait in a fantasy analyst. I'm get, I'm not going to give up on my White Sox offense yet. I maybe I should, but I'm not going to do it. He's still hitting the ball fairly hard, Vaughn. Um, good spot in a lineup that should be better than it's been. I think we can all agree on that. Still has a chance to get better when Eloy Jimenez returns. Vaughn's been hitting second or third in that lineup, which explains the counting stats: 31 uh, RBIs, 20 runs scored. Strikeout rate is up a little bit. I don't think we're going to see a ton of batting average upside. He also doesn't run at all. But, yeah, I think he's one of those guys, if you did see him dropped on waivers, you would probably pick him up in hopes that we'd see some better numbers here. So I think he's a hold, but it depends on the depth of the league and if there's some more intriguing options out there. Like if you – if I mean, Christopher Morell, what, he's hit like eight, eight home runs in ten games? Like you're probably going to start – Morell over Vaughn in a utility spot or something like that. Like roll with that, sure. But yeah, I think in most leagues probably a hold, but it's 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 a little closer for me just because he's somewhat one dimensional, does not bring speed at all. Is there do you see a good buy low on this team? They've been playing a little better recently. Uh and you know, you mentioned Lynn. I mean, Giolito's there. Uh, you know, Liam Hendricks is gonna be coming back. I mean, I I could see them being better than they did. I mean, how could they be worse? You know, I, I think this team talent wise, I don't know if there's been a bigger disappointment over the past couple of years than the, than the White Sox, because they have the pieces to compete. Uh, they just have not won. Uh, how much of that is a Tony La Russa thing? How much of that's an injury thing? I don't know, but uh, there's talent on this roster for sure. There is talent, man. I, I hope it comes around. Let, let me tell you about a player I've been really patient with, and, I, and I'm not sure if I've been too patient. I look at Miguel Vargas, Dodgers. Mm. He's got that great approach. He's got the really good walk rate. He qualifies at a couple different positions, but he's still sitting at a 233 average, only four home runs, get a couple of stolen bases. Dodgers have had a really bad run with pitching, and I know they have a couple of interesting young pitchers coming up. Yeah. Has my patience with Vargas been misplaced? Do you think he's eventually going to turn it around? Is he a cut or a keep? Uh, he's, he's a keep for me, uh, you know, qualifies in multiple positions has been a little better offensively after he was basically the first couple of weeks of the season, just walking and nothing else. Uh, but at least the, the luck started to even out a bit recently. He has a 797 OPS over the past calendar month, uh, four homers, 19 RBI. So starting to drive the ball a little bit more. He does have that plate discipline as well. You know, it depends on the depth of the league. I mean, he's out there in over 50% of Yahoo leagues right now, so he might be on your waiver wire, you know. Uh, but I think the multi-position eligibility piece in a Dodgers lineup, which I, I still like. Uh, so, yeah, I, I I would still roster him in most leagues where, where he's available. That's, that's where I'm leaning. Um, I'm going to give him another week or two, but um, getting a little bit – I'm getting a little bit antsy, I'll admit it. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Um, another one that maybe people are getting antsy with, uh, Key Brian Hayes with the Pirates. So Hayes is hitting 234, one home run through 45 games. And now if you go back to the start of last season with Key Brian Hayes, he's hitting 241 with eight home runs over his last 181 games. This year, he is six for 11 in stolen bases also. So he's running a little bit, but he's also... He's getting caught almost half the time, which is like amazing because I feel like nobody's getting, I mean, some people are getting caught stealing, but the success rate is pretty high right now. So that is discouraging as well. So you're not getting power. You're not getting average. The speed is a little spotty right now. So what do you do with Cabrian Hayes? He's a really funny player because he's almost got a middle infield profile in the sense that he's a great defensive player. As you mentioned, he, he is running, although maybe he shouldn't with that success rate. No power. 351 slugging just the one home run he's a cut for me and i say that with a little bit of sadness because you know hayes was a 
a very regarded prospect. He, he came up and hit, hit like crazy when he first he joined did. the Pirates. And I, I know we talked about the AL Central briefly a little bit. The NL Central is also up for grabs. I feel like any of those teams can tell themselves a story. Maybe not the Reds, but the other four teams. The Cardinals are starting to play better now. The Pirates, I'd love to see the Pirates be in contention all summer. It's my favorite park I've never been to. I'm actually overdue just to go to Pittsburgh, period. And I love how all the teams wear the same colors. I was saying on Twitter this week, they should bring back the Stargill Stars. Maybe a couple Stargill <laughs> Stars on the Brian Hayes helmet or yep. on the Brian Hayes hat would get him going. But I'm afraid they're going to shut down the running because even though Pittsburgh wants to run, when you're barely over 50%, you're hurting the team doing it. And if he doesn't run anymore, there's nothing here other than the fact that he plays every day. It's not like Pittsburgh is a destination lineup. So he he would be a cut for me. Yeah, I'm into that too, especially if he uh, you know gets the red light on the base paths. Like that's the one thing that he does well fantasy wise. His expected stats are actually a bit higher than uh, where he's been. He does make a good amount of contact. I believe his expected batting average is uh, 279. So maybe deserves a little better luck, but it's a it's a tough needle to thread at third base if you don't hit for power. Um, so yeah, I, I would say obviously if you're in a deeper than twelve team league, he's going to be rostered. You'll mm-hmm. find a spot for him. But in a shallow league, if you went in the year with high expectations, which we we did to an extent, mm-hmm. you can see the potential upside there. Yeah, I think I think he's a drop. And and as you mentioned, and this is like the understood baseline to all the stuff we talk about you're always going to season it to taste to your league your league parameters your league pen, penetration depth for the players and all that stuff it's it, it may be a case of some of these guys it may be a cut for one listener it may be a keep for a different listener although Hayes I would certainly steer towards the cut side final one from me so Javier Baez got the big contract with the Tigers mm-hmm. and you know the, the whole Colton and Wolfman ethos you know avoid those guys big contract first year okay that's fine maybe that explains last year but I'll be by his hitting 228 this year. And I can live with that average if he's giving you category juice. He's got three home runs. He's got three stolen bases. Even though the Tigers have been a little bit better than expected, it's still one of the weakest offenses in baseball. And the Yahoo market, this kind of is the sweet spot for a lot of the guys we're discussing. He's just over 54% rostered in Yahoo. So this, you probably, when I say keeper cut, I mean, you may be thinking about picking up bias. You may be thinking about dropping bias. I'm sure a lot of people are on the fence with hobby bias right now. I joke. Yeah. I joke that they're giving away Javi Baez sunglasses one day in Detroit. I said, yeah, you put them on and any pitch in the dirt looks like a strike because he will swing at anything. I yeah. don't know. He's, he's still a pretty young guy, young 30s. Can Javi Baez turn it around? Is he keep or cut? So what's uh, he is uh, – you know what? I, I think you've used this term. I know I've used it. Uh, maybe I borrowed it from you. Therapeutic drop. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. That's how I feel about Javi. No ad, no ad, no additional ad required. Just, just drop them. <laughs> uh, it feels good when you drop a player that is a headache, and I. That's how, how I feel about Javi Baez. What's interesting about him this year? The strikeout rate is way down. So, seventeen point three percent. He was twenty four point nine percent last year. He's thirty three point six percent in twenty twenty one. So he's making more contact, but he's making weaker contact. His barrel percentage this year is 2.3%. Two years ago, it was 13.4%. So even when he had this flawed approach, he was at least doing something with it when he hit the ball. I think he's just totally caught in between with his approach right now. And we're it's, seeing this: the speed has declined a little bit too. Mm-hmm. So you're not getting the speed. You're not getting the power. He's still not hitting for average, even though he's making more contact. So he's just a really confusing player. His baseball savant slider page is it's just sad to look at. It's and I, I say that with some empathy. You know, I I don't know. He just looks like a guy who needs to be sent to the the hit doctor. He needs to be sent to some new batting coach and try something different because he just looks really lost at the plate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think uh, like I said, you know, the headache involved there. I think it makes it easier for you on a daily basis where you're like, should I put him? Should I start him tonight? Like, I got this guy off waivers. Is he a better option? He, and sometimes it makes it easier just to drop that player that gives you that daily headache. Okay, we're in agreement on that. All right, so uh, if you guys have some names you're thinking about, you can always find us on Twitter. I'm at DJ Short. Scott is at Scott underscore Pianowski. Tell us the players you're thinking about dropping. Um, I'd love to hear that kind of stuff from you guys because you know I want to I want to know what's going on in, the, in your leagues. Uh, we can use that as an example going forward. So 
I think it's always useful to go into these names. It's a good exercise to talk about who are legitimate, real names to drop because it is so easy to just talk about who to add. And, and that's the flashy thing. But the hard thing to do is to drop a player with the risk of them bouncing back or someone else in your league picking them up and they you know, have a huge second half. What was our take? We talked about Alec Manola last week, and I, yeah. that's one reason why I didn't list him here. What was our takeaway on that? Was that was he? I don't know. Fortunately, I don't have him, Noah, so he's not my problem. And I don't mean yeah. to sound cavalier about it, but if somebody came to you and said, Manoa's killing me, I, I got guys I want to pick up. I mean, would you drop him to pick up, you know, Jared Lorenzen or somebody? Does that make sense uh, to you? I would not drop him for Lorenzen. I would just bench him for the foreseeable future. You okay. know what I mean? I, I, I feel like with a player like Manoa, that's one where you're going to have the constant paranoia that you drop him and he starts to pitch like he should. Last year, he probably, the numbers were better than maybe he deserved, but he was still, you know, you regarded him into the, coming into the season as a top 30, top 40 starting pitcher. At the very least, he's still capable of being that pitcher. So I would be very worried about dropping him uh, under those circumstances. I'm trying to think how we explain this. I know the home run fly ball rate is high. The, 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 the strikeouts high. have come. The strikeouts have come way down. The walks are yep. out of whack. Yeah, velocity down, almost a full tick. And he he was never a guy who threw gas anyway. I mean his no his highest fastball readout for his career is 93.6. So it's not like yeah. he's somebody who says, "Oh, here it is, come and hit it." I don't know. Man. Yeah, I uh, here's my thing with Manoa. I'm not telling you to drop him. This is gonna sound like a cop out, but whatever. I'm just gonna offer it up. If you told me you were leaning towards dropping him, I would not talk you out of it. I mean, the, he falls into the headache category too, because you you ex, you uh, you know spent some draft capital to get Manoa coming off the year he had last year. Big expectations. He's just a dead spot on your bench if you're not starting him. So I I get it. I wouldn't do it, but I get. It. You know what? Maybe I know people say you know you don't want to sell low and buy high. Although I argue that if you buy high and sell low better than anybody in your league, if you know which hot starters to believe in, if you know which guys are not going to turn it around better than your right. opponents, you'll actually be a great fantasy player. Yep. You can't, you can't, you probably can't trade Manoa on his own and get a lot for him, but maybe it's one of those things where it's like, okay, you, you put him in a trade to get it finished. Like you have a trade that's close and you want to get the trade done. You're like, okay, well, yeah, you throw me this other guy on your team, and I'll throw you Alec Manoa. Maybe he'll turn it around for your team. And then the guy thinks, okay, I'm getting Manoa for no risk. He's just a throw in. But you did it did get a deal done for you. Maybe he can be like a, a trade sweetener. So that way you have an out and out dropped him. And that also there, you have some agency on what roster he goes to, right? Maybe you can trade him to a team that can't hurt you. Yeah, I think there's another angle to this if you play like a dynasty league. You're going to get someone who maybe is at – not expected to compete this year saying, Hey, you know, I'll take a shot on Manoa. Maybe sure. you're selling him, you know, for pennies on the dollar to an extent, but there's still an opportunity to get something back that can help you this season. So there's certainly dynasty leagues where that could make some sense as well. So let's get into what we saw over the weekend with fab. And it was interesting for me because I, I felt like in my leagues, I have a lot of players who are either coming back from the injured list or have just underperformed and they just need to play well. So I wasn't super active in fab this weekend, but the most popular name that I saw in my league or there's two um, Matt McLean called up by the reds uh, in my NFBC uh, TGFBI league. He went for 137 at Jeff Erickson uh, not a huge surprise to see a red go to Jeff Erickson, but Matt McLean is a popular pickup this week. And in my Top Wars Mixed League, Bobby Miller, uh, the Dodgers are calling up Bobby Miller this week. Uh, top pitching prospect, I believe he's going to pitch on Tuesday. Went to Shelly Bear straight of uh, NBC Sports. Wrote a world uh, for 76. So those are the two top uh, bids in my leagues. Yeah, McLean was available in some of my leagues, and I bid – Quasi competitive, but not enough to win McLean, and and I feel bad about that. I I mentioned Michael Lorenzen in passing; he has two start week, and he's thrown the ball really well lately. And yeah. he's got the Royals on Monday. We know that's for all I know. By the time you listen to this, Michael Lorenzen could have allowed seven runs, but I do like him for this. If, if you're not going to play him in the two start week, you're not going to be into Lorenzen. I went after him in a few leagues, didn't get him. 
guys I did land, a, a player, this is not maybe a first-run guy, but Brian Daly Cruz has been doing some good things in Miami. And here comes a not just a Colorado series, but a four-game Colorado series. He's got five home runs, a oh, couple of steals, hitting 284. I think it's a really good time to get in on him. And another guy who I, I wish I was a little bit earlier on some other leagues, but he was still available in some of my bid leagues. Michael Walker has won three straight games. And okay. he's, man, he's starting he's starting to look like a guy. Where, where, look, I, I realized there was a time where Michael Walker was seen as like maybe like a sleeper Cy Young, you know, down ballot guy or something. We're, we're over that. But that 3.58, 1.15 ERA and whip, I think he could keep that for the rest of the year. He was a decent pitcher for the Red Sox last year, and I wish they had made yep. him more than kind of a token offer. And he exacted a little revenge on the Red Sox over the weekend. Yeah, he he had 11 strikeouts in the Kansas City game prior to that. San Diego is still – it's not as extreme a park as it used to be, but still a favorable place to pitch. There are some good matchups in that division. Just you know, avoid the Colorado starts if you can. He does pitch at the Yankees this week. I'm not sure I'm going to – Throw him to the Wolves on that start, and that's a weekend game too. It's an afternoon game. Sometimes that that park plays awfully small in those situations. But Michael Walker just inched over 50% roster ship in the last week or so. I, I think he's like a 70%, 80% pitcher. I'm, I'm happy to have some Walker shares. So Walker pitched against Corey Kluber on Sunday, and Kluber – had an early exit from that one. Now has a 6-2-6 DRA. Only one of the runs were earned, but it was his error uh, that opened up a big inning for the Red Sox. Uh, and they actually had a discussion on the broadcast. Like, when a pitcher makes an error, like, why is that an unearned run? Do you know what I mean? Like, where do you fall on that, Scott? If the pitcher is the one who makes the error and then a bunch of runs scored, should that be unearned or should that be earned? Because he kind of earned it. That's interesting. I never really thought about that. I my big bane about all this is that ev everything that's borderline is a hit and even stuff that looks like an obvious error to like nine out of 10 people. I feel like they just call stuff hits because the defensive player is happy and the hitter is happy. And so the pitcher yeah. matches. So what you keep two out of three people happy. And <laughs> I just want, I want, I just want to bring back official scoring that has a little bit of backbone to it. I feel like we've right. gotten way away from that. And but. there's like the home aspect to it too. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and then, of course, you know, people complain no matter what. And we've seen it with no hitters sometimes that if there's a borderline call, they just err on the side of keeping the no hitter alive. I guess maybe I don't mind that so much. Of course, we don't have no hitters go. Guys that no hitter for six innings and they take him out of the game because he's thrown 95 pitches. Yes, um, exactly. You, you, but by the way, I saw there was a complete game this weekend. I think it was Framber Valdez. In one of my leagues, uh, it's like an eight by eight league. It's got some funky categories in it, and one of it is shutouts, which I don't even think you can really draft towards shutouts because <laughs> so few guys get them. Yeah. But when you get a shutout, you're ready to start hugging strangers. And so <laughs> I looked at my stats on Sunday. I was I was watching the PGA. I played golf on Sunday, so I wasn't in front of the TV for a lot of the baseball. And I'm like, oh, I moved up to the standings. What did my team do? I got a shutout. Real? Oh, yeah. Wow, that's like the greatest thing. Yeah, you won the category. <laughs> yeah, but I moved up significantly. Somebody actually has two. I think Alcantara might have two shutouts this year. But huh. have we, it was a. Let me, go ahead. Let me ask you this: Have we? I get we want to save the pitcher, and we don't. We don't want guys. We don't want the Edwin Jackson 149 pitch no hitter. I I, I get it. You don't want to be reckless with people's careers. But have we gone too far with these hooks? I, I, I think it's gone a little bit too far. I think so. It's interesting because one of the rules that uh, they're experimenting with in the minors is this double hook rule, right? Where you lose your DH if you you know pull your pitcher from the game early. And the obviously the idea is to have your pitcher pitch deep. I mean, think about baseball and its marketing efforts. Like, a pitcher has the ball most of the game. The focus is on the pitcher. You want that pitcher to be a face of the sport. You know what I mean? Like last night, Sunday night, uh, the Mets and the Guardians played. Justin Verlander threw eight innings. Shane Bieber threw yep. – I, I think he threw eight innings too. Yeah, he did. Um, that's awesome to get that in a you know high-profile only game that night in Major League Baseball. Like baseball would love to have more of that because – Baseball, yeah. I mean, Mike Trout comes up, you know, four times a night. He might go 0 for 4. He's still the best player in baseball, but he may go 0 for 4 in this highly advertised game. But you know Berlander's going to pitch. You know Scherzer's going to pitch. You know you know Bieber's going to pitch. Garrett Cole, et cetera. You want those guys on the screen for as long as possible. 
let me just be a little bit pedantic. I, I, I don't have any problem with you referring to Mike Trout as the best player in baseball because he's been for such a long time. Yeah. But has Ronald Acuna wrestled that? If, if this okay. is one of those things where you're like, it's like a top 40, you know, Casey Case, yeah. counting it down. Yeah. Ronald Acuna, best player in baseball right now? Best, uh, best offensive player in baseball. How about that? Defense, I'm not sure. Oh, let me say that. Let me put this way. Let's just say we're going to redraft all the teams. Contracts don't matter. And any player you pick, you get for, say, the next three years. If I'm picking first, I think I'm picking yeah. Ronald Acuna. Yeah, I think I think that's totally true. Although I yeah. wouldn't blame maybe it took Otani. I mean, who's yeah, Otani would be number one. You know, Otani would be number one, but then Acuna would be two. Who would be three is the question. Is not Mike question. Trout. <laughs> not, not Mike Trout. Not Mike Trout. Are you are you worried about Julio Rodriguez at all? I mean, not that he's lost it all of a sudden, but I mean, what what's Julio? When is if you were redrafting now, when would you pull the trigger on Rodriguez? He would still be a first round pick for um, sure, but top five, top ten, later first round. Not top five at this point. Uh, I, I think you look back to his numbers last year. The expected stats were a little lower than what he actually did. Doesn't mean he's not a great player. Doesn't mean he's not a dynamic player. Doesn't mean he can't be 25, 25. But I think some of us were like, you know, second year, he'll make some improvements and progress. That's not always the way it goes. But I think as fantasy players, we're sometimes like, hey, he only played 140 games. You get 162. You know, you can round everything up a little bit. And that's just not the way real life works. If I were in a redraft, I would take Aaron Judge over Rodriguez instantly. I'm not meaning oh, yeah. to slam Rodriguez. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I'm just wearing my rose-colored glasses because it all comes back to Marcus Simeon. I would take Marcus Simeon over Julio Rodriguez. All right. I, I, I'm good with that. And, by the way, Aaron Judge would be the number three player selected. Oh, probably. What a what a, month. <laughs> what a fun week for him, right? Yeah. You know, the, the whole look in the dugout. He feels like he's been hitting a home run every day. It's – um. Even as a Red Sox fan, I can admit that just having a player like Aaron Judge on the Yankees is just good for baseball. You know, we need sure. whether you're a, a, the biggest Yankee fan in the world or you, you know, because the Yankees are one of those teams you're either in or out on them, right? Yeah, you're either yeah. wearing the pinstripes everywhere or you can't stand them. I, I can't yes. stand them, but I can admit that Aaron Judge is just, it's just fun to have that guy around. So the Yankees had Aaron Judge on the bench yesterday, but the Yankees still beat the Reds on our Sunday Peacock game. Luis Severino looked really good. This weekend, though, Sunday morning means MLB leadoff. You can watch exclusive live games all season long on Peacock this week. We have an awesome matchup, maybe a potential World Series preview. The Dodgers take on the MLB best Rays in Tampa mm. Bay. Catch the action live this Sunday. At 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. That should be really fun. Good matchup there. Kind of amazing with the start the Rays have had. The Orioles are only three and a half games back of I'm the looking, Rays. If, I, if I have this right, by the way, that uh, that Sunday game will be Gavin Stone against Taj Bradley. If everything, mm. no rainouts come about or nobody yeah. shuffles their rotation. So a good, not only a great game to watch, period, but just a great scouting opportunity to see two yeah. really interesting young pitchers. And, of course, you get... DJ Short has been part of that program, so you get your quality work as well. And you've been yep. giving out winning props on that show too, right? I Yeah, hit two out of three yesterday. Got Severino under on the strikeouts. He had a pitch count, uh, 75 pitches. So that that worked out for me. I also had the under on Corey Kluber's strikeouts, which went very well. He struck what out was one, it, one, one and a half? What was it? <laughs> it's actually four and a half. So okay, that, that, okay. Was like a, that was a gimme. Text uh, me next time on that one so I can punch it too. <laughs> I can put yeah. that next to my Miami Heat Eastern Conference yeah. Championship I'm, ticket that I didn't punch. I'm not sure how many more starts Corey Quiver is going to get, but take advantage of it while you can. Yeah, it's is it you know I, I don't mean to be cavalier. Let me just check out one guy. I don't mean to be cavalier about it, but it's just it's sad to me that Corey Kluber used to be the best pitcher in baseball. Oh, yeah. Cy Young Award winner. He was a dominant, and he pitched well every game, and he went deep every game, and mm -hmm. he had some swagger, and he just that wipeout slider. He, he was. He was a monster, man. Yep. Just baseball yep. sports are hard, man. You know, time comes for you, and you have mm -hmm. no idea what your window is going to be, especially pitching. It's such a hard thing to do. It's such an unnatural act. I I take no joy watching Corey Kluber, you know, be this version of him because I want to remember the great Corey Kluber. I mean, you could say the same, not maybe as extreme, but Max Scherzer's season has been just one headache after Another, even in a start, he pitched well in game one of the doubleheader against the Guardians on Sunday. Uh, he had a callus split open on his thumb. 
what the velocity was down. He's mostly throwing curveballs. Like, you know, he hasn't had a Max Scherzer type of season. Will it happen at any point? I, I have no idea. I have literally no clue. His strikeout call his strikeout column is six two, six, three, three, six, five. That's not the Max Scherzer I know. No. And I realize he hasn't gone past six innings in any game. So that's part of it. You but it's Redrafting, when would you take Max Scherzer? What round would he go oh. in, say, a, a 15 team league? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You just I avoid it. Yeah. Well, of I course, you're not. invested in the Mets emotionally. So I can <laughs> see. Well, would you more, be more interested in Scherzer or Verlander? Verlander, for sure. Uh, okay. He he looked good last. I mean, he I thought great. he did. Yeah. That Ramirez home run hasn't landed yet, but I, yeah. I thought <laughs> I, I Verlander yeah. looked very good. Yeah. 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 Not even. Yeah. Scherzer is it, it, he's in the DeGrom ca- category to me now. Like, it, it's just. You know literally nothing what to expect. He could throw, you know, six more innings this season for all I know. I just have no clue. Yeah, Colorado this week. It's just, man, no no rest for the weary, man. Oof. Yeah. Um, so we're going to close the show with something fun here. Of course, the, the Indy 500 will take place this Sunday. We broadcast live on NBC. So I was thinking of what we could do to theme with the Indy 500. And I thought we're going to do a draft here. It's going to be a fast food draft our favorite fast food items could be a sandwich a burger could be a side could be a dessert whatever you want we're gonna go three picks deep on this each i'm gonna give you the number one overall pick scott so go for it yeah i'm gonna take the ronald acuna fast food i'm gonna take the the burger call the hamburger call the cheeseburger i was a hamburger guy for a long time and then i don't know i just found out the joy of Put a little cheddar cheese on it. Make sure the cheese is melted. That's how you make a burger the right way. I'm a medium guy. We someday we'll have a condiment draft that we'll discuss what to put on that burger. Where do you get it from? Where? You know, it's funny. Um, a couple of different places. Uh, McDonald's is quarter pounder with cheese, which they make when you order it, is actually really good. I realize you know every franchise is independently owned and operated so there are certain mcdonald's in my neighborhood that are better than others but yep. there's a couple i know of that make a really good burger and it's funny i used to go to this place called the red coat tavern in royal oak my favorite restaurant near where i live uh, greater detroit and i don't know the pandemic a lot of people left the restaurant it's different people now i, mean, I used to have my own table I, I used to have i used to i knew the bartenders i knew the whole wait staff and uh, they used to be open really late, so I could go in there late, which is probably a bad idea to eat late. You know, the hours are different now. The staff's different now. And I actually, one of my best friends in Michigan works at, and I've mentioned this before, uh, works at the Outback Steakhouse in Madison Heights, Michigan. And the burgers at this, the, I, I guess the Outback, I, again, every franchise independently owned and operated, but the burgers at the Madison Heights Outback are, fa- they're out of this world. They're, I thought the Outback burgers were unbeatable. Uh, the uh, Red Coat burgers were outbeatable, unbeatable. They're, the Outback burgers are amazing. They're only like 11 or 12 bucks. You get sides with it. It's, it's You can't beat it, man. Go go no. Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Ask for Dean. Tell him Scott sent you. I'll probably be there anyway. <laughs> you can't go wrong. There's a free pro. And Dean always jokes about me. He's like, when are you going to write an article on me on the internet? Tell tell, tell everybody how the great the restaurant is. Well, shout out. Here it is. Here's his shout out. Uh, Madison Heights Outback. Uh, go no. there on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Dean and Paige will be behind the bar, and they're fantastic. They, they got three TVs. You watch whatever, you know, I'll go there. One reason I go there is they got the three TVs. I only have two in my office. So I go there. They'll put on whatever I want. I can, I'm can. i watching hockey. I'm watching golf. I'm watching basketball. I'm watching baseball. It's, you can't beat it. Lumen Onion at Outback Steakhouse is a, it's the top tier. A million calories, item, but yes, sure. it's, it's it, really it, good. It's Delicious. It's got delicious. Weeks, weekends of calories, but yeah, even the yeah. desserts there are really good. Yeah, the Outback, it's not just you think steakhouse, I'm getting a steak. They have a lot, a lot of their non steak items are very good. Their chicken is outstanding. The salad is actually quite good too. I I am going to go my pick. I'm going to go with French fries, but I'm going to go with a very specific French fry. Okay. The McDonald's French fries. Now, I am not a big McDonald's eater per se. Like, I'm not. I don't necessarily get their burgers, but if I need like a comfort food and I just happen to be going by McDonald's, I will go and just get like a large French fries and I will be taken back to like my childhood. It's just the perfect crispiness and the salt on the fries. Like you cannot get that anywhere else. I mean, there are a lot of, well, we'll mention some good menu items, you know, around the fast food uh, world, but I don't think anything tops McDonald's French fries. 
really simple rule with french fries they are great when they're fresh and when they're not you just want to chuck them so if you yes. can get sometimes you you go through the drive through and you ask for a fresh batch of fries and if it's a good crew they'll they'll take care of you sometimes they'll wonder why you're asking for that <laughs> also uh i'm i go through a lot of mcdonald's drive throughs just to get the fountain coke i don't know why a fountain coke tastes better than a can it does a, taste a, better diet coke yeah. tastes better than a, a can of coke or a, a bottle yeah. um but i've been drinking a lot of diet there coke was, for a lot of years there was actually an article about this uh a couple of years ago why the fountain soda at mcdonald's tastes better than a regular soda i would I advise you to go look into that i will you mentioned comfort food that's going to bring me to my second round pick great pick with the french fries mac and cheese man it's just if you need to pick me up a little homemade mac and cheese goes a long way i mean it's i'm half italian i eat pasta every major holiday don't don't eat turkey i've, I've forced everybody who's been in my life to, to live that <laughs> custom too so i'm a big pasta guy and cheese cheese just makes everything better it makes the burger better it makes the mac better so um, mac and cheese is my second pick my my kids would very much respect that pick. If they could have mac and cheese every day, they would totally be cool with that. And um, if you were a good parent, you'd be giving them mac and cheese every I, day. It's, hey, it's, we have lots of boxes of mac and cheese ready to be consumed in my house. Good man. Uh, good man. The next pick for me is a, is a good chicken sandwich. And I actually had one. In, I'm at the NBC Sports headquarters today. And they had a very delicious uh, chicken sandwich uh, for lunch today, a special. But my favorite chicken sandwich, and there's a lot of good ones out there. Uh, I love the Popeye's chicken sandwich. I don't know if you've had that one, but something that, I don't know, it's just something that Popeye's does with the breading of their chicken, which is just irresistible to me. There's a spicy one, there's a regular one. I think they're both good. But the Popeye's chicken sandwich is a, is a top tier menu item. It's a great call. The chicken sandwich is one of those things that if you go, if you order a chicken sandwich that you haven't had before, you know, you're at a golf course, you're in an airport. I feel like every chicken sandwich I've ever had has been unbelievably delicious or like two bites. I want to throw it out. But when you find the right chicken sandwich, I lately I've stumbled onto a Buffalo chicken sandwich that Arby's has. It's terrific. Unfortunately, you open it up, it's a mess. And it, you know, you have to immediately launder whatever you're wearing because you're going to make a mess on your clothes just opening the sandwich. But other than that, you can get past that. You know, if you can eat it in a safe space, you know, it's it's such a good sandwich. And, and that's going to tie into my third pick, which I have chicken tenders down. Again, chicken tenders, there's a lot of variance with the chicken tender. If you get the wrong tender, I almost went with McNuggets, although I'm once you learn how McNuggets are made, it's kind of hard to look back at McNuggets again. But if you get the right chicken tenders, oh, my God, they're unbelievable. And that's another Outback item. It's actually pretty good. They're, they make them in-house. But um, And then the condiments come into play. You get your honey mustard, you get your ranch, whatever it is, uh, blue cheese, some people might go for. But I love a good chicken tender. Yeah, actually, a great condiment, and we'll have to do a condiment trap at some point, is the Chick-fil-A sauce, which I love with the waffle fries. That is my, my mm -hmm. last pick here. Waffle fries, again, if they're fresh, awesome. If they're cold, not great at all. If you get them just right, just fresh, dip in that Chick-fil-A sauce, that is that is heaven right there. Let me ask you this. What's the best food item, if you can think of anything, that you've ever had at a ballpark? Uh, there is a steak sandwich at City Field, which is outstanding. Pat LaFrieda steak sandwich. Mm. Uh, not maybe the best on like a really hot day. But it is very good. I also like Shake Shack at, at the ballpark at City Field. Um, yeah, I've only been to City Field once, and I was blown away at just how many interesting stuff. food items they had. I remember thinking, yeah. I, I want to eat at like five of these places, but I'm yeah. you know I'm only here to eat once. But <laughs> um, yeah, I like I think City Field's underrated, man. Maybe nobody talks about it with any you know, goosebump glow time. or anything. Maybe it's a little bit older now, but. I, I think they got to win there. They got to win a World Series. Okay. There. Maybe that'll, I mean, I think when the Mets made their run in 2015 in the World Series, it was a big spotlight on the ballpark. But if they make another big run, um, you know, they have the focus of the game on them. I think people appreciate the ballpark a little bit more. I don't even remember what I had, but I remember the two times I went to San Francisco. I just remember really liking the food. And, and the person I was with got some food that they really liked too. But uh, that, and that's my favorite. I, I feel like Fenway, because I grew up in New England, Fenway doesn't count for me. My favorite park is San Francisco, really close to, to Wrigley Field, which is which was awesome. And the the one time I went to Wrigley Field, my friend Scott Gleason got our tickets upgraded. We were four rows behind the plate. 
drinking some old style beers. And I was convinced that day I could hit Tonko and Solani because the Cardinals sure did. And it was awesome. It was a Friday afternoon game, like uh, 10, 12 years ago. The Cubs are nowhere near contention. The places, the bar was packed before the game and the crowd was really into it. It was just, Chicago is so, uh, it's a great eating city too. You cannot go wrong with food in Chicago, but uh, yeah, ballpark food, man. I, great. I've had some bad hot dogs here and there. I'm not going to say every stadium takes their concessions as seriously, but I feel like some parks are really trying to get it right. And, and San Francisco is one of those parks for me. Yeah. We'll have to do a ballpark draft at some point. That oh, can for be sure. a, for sure. a future show, uh, but that'll do it for us today. Remember to subscribe to circling the bases, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're listening on Apple podcasts, rate and review, if you like what you're hearing again, I'm at DJ short on Twitter. Scott is at Scott Fianowski. Take care everyone. We will see you next time.